the first Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist church school teacher, full-time church school teacher in California, was a lady named Mrs. Alma McKibben. Mrs. McKibben rented Ellen White's house when Ellen White um, went to Australia. Um, Ellen White had owned a home in Healdsburg, California. When she came back from Australia, she decided not to live in Healdsburg, but instead to buy a home over by the sanitarium, St. Lena Sanitarium. So Mrs. McKibben rented Ellen White's house. On one occasion, Mrs. McKibben said she, she never was a good sleeper. She couldn't sleep well at night. And um, on this particular occasion, she was not feeling well at all. So she traveled from Healdsburg over to the St. Helena Sanitarium, hoped to get in, but the sanitarium was full. They had no beds open. So until a bed opened up, she stayed with one of Ellen White's secretaries, Miss Sarah Peck. And Miss Peck lived in a little cottage just, well, if you're facing Elmshaven, it would be to the right. And um, so Mrs. McKibben said, there I was at night, I was on a, a couch or sofa, something right in the front room. And I could look right out the window, right up at Ellen White's house. And she said, I felt so miserable. I just didn't feel good at all. And uh, in early hours of the morning, she said, there was a light came on in the Ellen White's writing room. And so she said, even though I knew that Sister White didn't know that I was there, just knowing that somebody else at least was awake on the place made me feel a little bit better. Now she said Ellen White, of course, believed in fresh air. So she had all of her windows there in Elmshaven open. And she said Miss Peck also tried to practice that part of our health message. So she had her windows open. And she said through the, the night air, she heard something that she had never heard before or since, anything like it. And that was Ellen White Pray. She said Ellen White prayed out loud. Well, we have other records of her praying her private prayers out loud. So the story makes sense from other records that we have. But she said Mrs. White began to pray. And she said it was not our father, it was my father. She said it was such an earnest prayer. She said, I, I've never heard anything like it. Now, if you know anything about Mrs. McKibben, Mrs. McKibben was a real Bible student. In fact, she wrote some of our very earliest Bible textbooks. She was a Bible scholar. And she said, I used to read in the Bible about the burden that Isaiah or the burden that Jeremiah carried for the people of God. But she said, I never, until that evening, that night, she said, I never really understood what it was for a prophet to carry a burden for an entire people. She said, oh, we all carry burdens for our loved ones, our family members. But she said that night as Ellen White began to pray, she said she began to implore God, earnestly pray to God that he would stand by and help keep the leaders of this church faithful, that they would never um, succumb to some of the temptations that come along to, to deviate from the truth and she said how she prayed that God would help the leaders of this church to remain faithful. And then she said after she had prayed earnestly on behalf of the leaders of the church, she began to pray for the ministers, the men who stand week after week in the pulpit. And she again, she said she prayed most earnestly that God would keep the ministers faithful, that they would preach only truth from the pulpits of our churches. And she said, after she had prayed some time for the pastors of this church, she prayed for the teachers, the men and the women that are standing in our classrooms and are trying to lead young people to Jesus. She said how she prayed so earnestly that God would stand by them as they are trying to preach or to teach these young people and to lead by example these young people to give their hearts to Jesus. She said, as long as I live, and she lived to be over 100 years old when she finally died, she said, I'll never forget that prayer that night there as I was waiting to get a room in the St. Lena Sanitarium, hearing Ellen White pray one-on-one, -on -one, when she did not know anyone was listening. This was not a public prayer. She thought she was the only one besides God that was listening, praying on behalf of this church. She said that was the first time she had just a small inkling of what it is for a prophet to carry a burden for an entire church.
In 1868, God used Ellen White in a very unusual way in the Washington, New Hampshire church. A little background about that church. It's the, it was the oldest congregation of Sabbath-keeping Adventists in the world. And they had a pastor for a period of time named Frederick Wheeler. But Frederick Wheeler was called away in about 18, in the late 1850s. And so for several years, they did not have a pastor and they were spoiled. Most of our churches in those days did not have pastors. We didn't have enough ministers, ordained ministers to pastor churches. They were out doing evangelism. But that little church did have, had for many years had a pastor. But then, as I just said, he was called away. So without a pastor and being kind of spoiled by having one, things didn't continued to develop well spiritually for that congregation. In fact, it finally got to the place where they were hardly holding services anymore. Some were still subscribing to the review, the church paper, the review, but spiritually the congregation was in decline. And James and Ellen White and another minister, John Andrews, Jane Andrews, heard about this and they decided to come and visit the Washington, New Hampshire church. And some way, word got out that the Whites were coming. And of course, they needed to make certain that they have services if the Whites are coming. They can't admit that things are not going well spiritually. So they organized services. And on December 23, 1868, something very interesting happened in a meeting with that church. Not in the church itself, apparently, but in the home of the man that for many years was the first elder of that church, Cyrus Farnsworth. In that meeting, which lasted for five hours, God showed Ellen White the condition of the spiritual condition and things that were going on in the lives of various members of that church. And she had not met most of these people ever before, but under the Spirit of God, she would point to someone and she would begin to describe what was going on in their lives. Some of the people she was um, she was encouraging them. People had said negative things about them and she was trying to encourage them by saying, you know, they're not being fair to you, things that have been shown. How would she even know these if God hadn't shown her? Because she had just come to town. She didn't know these people. Others, she was show that they were doing things that were not right, even though they were claiming to live otherwise. Well, seated on, in, in that meeting somewhere towards the front of the group where they were meeting in Cyrus's house, Cyrus Farnsworth's house, was a young man, Cyrus's nephew, Eugene Farnsworth. Eugene thought to himself, if Ellen White is for real, if she's not just making all this up and somebody's told her all this, she's gonna rebuke my father, William Farnsworth. That was Cyrus's older brother, William Farnsworth. Now, Eugene, the son, knew what most people did not know, and that is that William Farnsworth was using tobacco again. He had said he'd given it up, but he was using it. And um, so here he is, out in the woods in the snow, sometimes he would chew a little tobacco, spit into the snow, kick it over with his boot. His son who was working behind him, working with him out in the woods, he would come along and see what was going on. He knew what his father was doing, that his father was being a hypocrite. But nobody else, maybe one other person in the church knew, but almost nobody knew that William Farnsworth so it was using tobacco. So here is Eugene sitting there thinking, if she's genuine, she'll bring this up. She'll point it out that my father is doing this. And as he would say later, almost as soon as the thought went through his mind, Ellen White turned to, you, to William Farnsworth and said, and I've been shown that you're a slave of the nicotine habit. Now, what do you think is going through Eugene's mind at that point? Obviously, he's very surprised because he just barely thought, well, this is what she'll do if she's really from God. And now here she is rebuking William Farnsworth. Well, that meeting went on for about five hours, as I just said a minute ago. And I don't know about you, but most of us have a thing or two in our lives that we just do not have pointed out in front of everybody in the church. I can imagine some people are probably sitting kind of slumped down in their chairs or whatever, thinking, I hope she doesn't point at me. But it, a real revival broke out. And people that had, you know, there was a small farming community People that had cheated each other in farming, business deals, etc., cetera, were, were uh, asking for forgiveness, promising to make things right. I mean, a revival broke out. Well, once the parents, the adults, had made things right with God, then on Christmas Day, December 25, 1868, 
James and Ellen White and Elder Andrews, Jane Andrews, they started working on the young people, trying to get them to give their hearts to the Lord. And 13 young people gave their heart to the Lord that day as a result of that meeting. And um, uh, five others that were not there, but later heard about it, did also. So out of that revival came 18 young people. 12 of them decided to be baptized right then. So they went out, this is middle of winter in New Hampshire, but thick snow. They went out, chopped a hole in the ice and baptized 12 of those young people. The other six decided to wait till the spring. Now, I'm from California. My guess is I'd have been with the six waiting till the spring when the water was a bit warmer, but 12 of those young people. Someone later counted up to see what happened to those 18 young people that were, gave their heart to the Lord in that revival of 1868. Nine of them eventually became workers for the church, either pastors, teachers, Bible workers, nurses, and as far as could be told, all of them remain church members as a revival of the 1860, uh, of 1868, just showing how God worked in a unique way, one that we would not necessarily expect, but a unique way to bring revival and conversion to so many people there in Washington, New Hampshire. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to go to the mailbox and find a letter with Ellen White's return address on it? Well, of course, that's not going to happen to us because she died a long time ago. But let me tell you a story about a young man who did have that happen to him. He was a young minister in Australia in the 1890s. And one day he went to get his mail and there was an envelope with the return address, Ellen G. White. And he thought to himself, what in the world is she writing to me for? What have I done? Why do I deserve a letter from her? And he was a bit nervous about it, frankly, and he prayed, I think, a very good prayer. Lord, give me the courage to open this envelope and then give me the strength to do whatever it is that God has shown her I should be doing. So he took the envelope out into the bush and knelt down and prayed that prayer. Give me the courage to open this envelope and then give me the strength to do whatever God has shown her I should be doing. And he tore open the envelope, pulled out the letter, and in essence, here's what she told him. Preach shorter sermons. Well, he later admitted that he was preaching sermons about an hour to hour and a half long. And he was thinking about preaching even longer because if he did, he might hit more people in the congregation. And here was this advice, preach shorter sermons. His name was Elder George B. Starr. What did Elder Starr do during most of his career? He was a chaplain in several of our different uh, sanitariums, both in Australia and in the United States. And what practical advice God gave that young man. Learn how to say what you want to say. Say it succinctly. I mean, if there's one thing that sick people don't like, it's someone who comes and just sits and talks and talks and talks. And here was the advice that God gave this young man. Learn how to say what you need to say in a short time and don't just go on and on and on. Talk about practical counsel. It certainly was in the case of Elder George B. Starr. Ellen White enjoyed music, good music. And if you read her writings, you'll find a number of places where she talks about the kind of music that is really appropriate for a Christian to be listening to. She used to tell her grandchildren, children, we must learn to sing the songs of Zion here if we would join the angel choir yonder. She knew something about the angel choir because she heard the angel choir sing in vision on more than one occasion. In fact, one time when I was talking with Ellen White's youngest granddaughter, Grace Jacques, she told me that on occasion, apparently this didn't happen very often, 
But on occasion, when Ellen White, when her grandmother would come from her bedroom in the morning, she would ask them in the family, did you hear the angel choir singing last night? And they would say, no, Grandma, we didn't hear any angels singing last night. But Grace told me that as they talked amongst themselves in the family, they came to the conclusion that on one, you know, rare occasions, once in a while, God would send the angel choir to sing to Ellen White in a prophetic dream of the night, to lift just momentarily the burden that he knew she was carrying as his messenger. Now this business of, or this having heard the angel choir sing, there's an interesting story that comes down. One time Ellen White was uh, speaking at a prayer meeting. I believe if I remember correctly, it was at the St. Lena Sanitarium. Anyway, it was a weekly prayer meeting. And the congregation was singing kind of listlessly like we sometimes do, just kind of mumbling the words, not thinking much about it. And she stopped them right in the middle of their singing. And she said, now brothers and sisters, I've heard the angel choir sing in vision. And they don't sound like this. They sing with feeling and with expression. Don't you think that we could do a little bit better? And the story is that they did a lot better. Ellen White's favorite hymn probably will be of no surprise. It is Jesus, lover of my soul. When you think about all that that woman wrote about Jesus and the, and the very popular books, some of the most beloved books that she wrote, Things like the desire of ages and steps to Christ, and even the great controversy between Christ and his angels and Satan and his angels. It is no wonder that Jesus, lover of my soul, was her favorite hymn. How do we know that? Because she says that was her favorite hymn. Now I know various people say various hymns were her favorites, but she says in a letter to a friend in 1906 that after she had preached at a certain place, she had them sing my favorite hymn, Jesus, lover of my soul. Earlier, many years earlier than that, in her own diary, private diary, she never expected anybody to read this. She wrote out in longhand two stanzas of the hymn. And then she wrote afterwards, my whole being longs after the Lord. I am not content to be satisfied with occasional flashes of light. I must have more. That's typical of Ellen White, thoroughly in love with Jesus, and it's even shown in her favorite hymn. I'd like to share a story about how Ellen White worked for a church leader. It's a church leader that probably most Seventh-day Adventists have heard about. His name was Uriah Smith. For many years, Elder Smith was editor of our church paper. He was known as the author of Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. He was a poet. He was an inventor. In other words, he did a lot for this church, but on occasion, Elder Smith would get on the wrong side of things. Back in 18, about 1881, 1882, there was a controversy in the newly opened Battle Creek College. The president of the school, or they called him principal then, the principal of the school thought we shouldn't have very many rules for the students, and that the rules we did have, we shouldn't enforce. And Elder Smith agreed with the principal. On the other side was the president of the General Conference, G.I. Butler. And he thought we should have a lot of rules and we should enforce them rigorously or vigorously. And the head of the English department also agreed. So you could see there was a controversy. And it got so bad they had to close the college for a whole year until things had calmed down and they could decide they got a new principal and they could decide how they wanted to proceed. Well, then came Minneapolis, the great Righteousness by Faith General Conference session. And again, Elder Smith, this man who contributed so much to our church, Elder Smith was on the wrong side of things. He was not one of those that accept, or that readily, easily accepted the new insights into righteousness by faith. And this bothered Ellen White because her heart had responded to the messages of Elders Jones and Wagner. And she herself had been teaching some of these things 
for, for quite some time before. And so here to have this man who had contributed so much on the wrong side, and she tried to reach out to him. After the session, back in Battle Creek, he didn't want to even talk to her. And this troubled Ellen White. On December 31, 1890, she tried to reach out one more time to this man. He was editor of the paper at the time. So this is not someone who's gotten unhappy and gone off by himself. He's still editor of the paper. And she sat down, the letter was 12 typewritten pages, double spaced typewritten pages. And I want to just read a few lines too, so you get some feel for what she said to Elder Smith and the intensity under which she worked when she was burdened on behalf of a soul. And then I want to tell you the good part of the story is what was Elder Smith's response? She started her letter, Dear Brother Smith, I have been remarkably exercised in regard to your case several times during my last round of labors. I have been greatly blessed of the Lord, but at times your case has been presented before me in a very clear light, just where you are standing. I have carried the burden with, what, with but little hope that I could do you any good. Well, of course, he wouldn't even talk to her. So how could she do him much good? Then she reviews some of the things going back to when the college had to be closed and talks to him about Minneapolis. And then she comes back to her appeal. I am sorry that you are affected with defective spiritual eyesight. Now that's strong language. And she's writing, the prophet's writing to the editor of the paper. I beg of you for your soul's sake to buy of the heavenly merchantman gold that you may be rich, white raiment that you may be clothed, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. And then she refers to some more things that have happened and she comes back again to her appeal. My brother Uriah Smith, whom I have loved and respected in the Lord, you have been working at cross purposes with God, practicing upon yourself deceptions, which if you continue as you have done, will be, will be succeeded with deceptions and delusions, which will end in irrevocable separation from God. She could not be clearer. If you do not change, you will be lost. And she writes to him some more, talking to him about Jesus and what he's done. Without me, said Christ, ye can do nothing. Do you refuse to fall on the rock? If so, there is not the slightest assurance in your case that you will ever recover yourself out of the snare of the devil. She writes a little bit more. And then she comes to her conclusion. Well, she's still two pages from the conclusion, but let me just read a few more lines. Why your particular case agonizes my soul so continuously, I cannot define. Again and again have I seen the blindness was upon you to an alarming degree. I give you up to the hands of Jesus, and then think I have not more to say, not another word. Then I find my soul torn with anguish, and I am weeping and praying with strong cryings and tears. Take not thy Holy Spirit from him. Oh, let something from thy spirit break this spell. Now, when Ellen White was working for a soul, this is the way she would write, strong. There is no way that you can misunderstand. And the tears, there are other places where she talks about the tears falling on the paper as she's writing to the individual. Here it's happening again as she's writing to Elder Smith. Well, what was Elder Smith's response? Actually, Ellen White wrote him another shorter letter a few days later, which is typical also. When she had a real burden for somebody, she'll write him a long letter, the person, man or woman, she'll write them a long letter. And then a few days later, she may write a second. And in our files, sometimes we have a third. I mean, it's like she cannot let go of this soul. She's not gonna let them go to Satan. She's gonna try everything she knows to keep them on the Lord's side. Well, what was Elder Smith's response? Now, Ellen White did not tell him to do what he did, but he asked if he could come see her. And of course, that's what she wanted to, wanted to talk with him. And he asked if he could bring along a few church leaders with him. And so he invited the president of the general conference and a few people like that. And then, as again, I repeat, she didn't ask him to do this, but he read every single word of this private testimony in front of the general conference president and others. And the account is that with tears of repentance and confession, he broke down and acknowledged that he had been wrong. But that was not enough. That was not enough for Elder Smith because Elder Smith knew he was a church leader and he knew there was more he needed to do. There was a meeting where there were ministers present going on and he asked if he could speak to the pastors. 
and he was given permission. Now, the report is that on this occasion, he did not read the entire testimony. He described it, described that he had received a letter from Ellen White, told something about what was in it. And because he had divided the working force of this church, some had agreed with him, some had disagreed with him, going clear back to the situation with the college. Again, the report is that with tears of repentance and confession, he broke down and wept and begged their forgiveness. But that was not enough for Elder Smith. Because you see, Elder Smith knew he was a church leader and he had divided not just the working force, the pastors, but he had divided the local congregation. And so he asked if on Sabbath, he could speak to the congregation in the large dime tabernacle in Battle Creek. And again, he did not read the testimony. The report is that he described it and then again with tears of repentance and confession, he begged their forgiveness apologized and asked that they forgive him for what he had done and his wrong attitude and for dividing them also, some agreeing with him, some agreeing with the other side. Was Elder Smith perfect after this? No, of course not. But was he a changed man? I think he was. And let me tell you why. Now remember, Elder Smith worked for the Review, the church paper, for a total of about 50 years and probably 30 or so of those years he was editor. In 1897, so seven years after this letter, six or seven years later, the General Conference Session of 1897 decided to make a change. Guess who they put in to be editor of the paper? A.T. Jones. A.T. Jones, who of course was so right about righteous by faith, but it really had been very rude to Elder Smith in 1888 in Minneapolis because they disagreed on other things too, like the identification of the 10 toes of the 10 kingdoms or the 10 horns. They agreed on most of them, but one or two they didn't agree on. And Smith, kind, kindly refined gentleman that he was, got up and told him why he thought his identification was correct. And Brash Elder Jones got up and said, well, you've heard Brother Smith, but he's all wrong. And he doesn't know what he's talking about. In essence, that's what he said. And here's, the, here's who they really are. The man that had publicly humiliated him, humiliated Elder Smith, is now made his boss. Now, Elder Smith that year was 65 years of age. He had written a number of books, he had royalties. He had patented some things, so he had money coming from patents. He also had a large house that he rented rooms to his students in Battle Creek College. Most of us, if the guy that had, or the person that had belittled us a few years earlier in a public way at a general conference session, became our boss, what would we do? We'd quit. What did Elder Smith do? He continued on. In 1901, they decided, the General Conference Session in 1901, they decided to put Elder Smith back in as editor. And when Elder Smith died two years later, uh, as he collapsed as he was walking to the office, he was editor. My point is that God worked through Ellen White to help change a man who contributed much to this church. And the evidence is that his life did change and he was a different person after receiving the testimony from Ellen White. In the early 1850s, there was a member of a small church in the state of New Hampshire whose name was Stephen Smith. The church that he was a member of is the Washington, New Hampshire Church, and sometimes we refer to it as our very first Seventh-day Adventist church. It was certainly the first congregation of Sabbath-keeping Adventists in all the world. But Stephen Smith was one of these interesting fellows that you, in all candor, you wish you didn't have in your church because he was very critical of everything. He liked to get on people's cases about this, that, or the other thing. He would sometimes lash out at the speaker if there was a speaker, if he didn't like what they were saying. He might stand up in the middle of the sermon and tell him he was wrong, or he might wait till the sermon was over and then stand up and tell him he was wrong. I mean, you get the picture. This is a guy, a fellow that you really would prefer not be in your congregation. And eventually it became so bad that they had to disfellowship him. 
But God doesn't give up on a person just because we finally have to say it's not working. You know, we don't really need you as part of our congregation. Stephen Smith was living a few miles from Washington in a little village called Unity, New Hampshire. He and his wife, Matilda. And with this sharp tongue, always criticizing, always critical, my impression of this man was that if you were walking down the street and you saw him coming towards you, you would walk across the street and walk down the other side so that you didn't have to meet him because you didn't know what he would say. But his wife was a, from all accounts, a sweet, loving, lovable Christian. And they had some children and people used to wonder, poor Matilda, her name was Matilda Smith, poor Matilda, living with that mean, grumpy, angry old man. What in the world are those kids? Think of them having a father like that. And old Brother Smith, he just went through life grumping and complaining and being angry at everybody. But his wife continued to subscribe to the Review, the church paper, the Review and Herald, as it was called then. And week by week, the Review would come and she would read it. Stephen wasn't interested in her paper, but apparently he let her subscribe. Well, about 1857, Ellen White was shown the case experience of Stephen Smith. She'd already met him, she'd heard about him, but God gave her a message and she sat down and wrote it to Stephen Smith. And when the letter came, Stephen Smith realized who it was from. He thought to himself, what does that old woman have for me? I don't want to listen to her. I don't have any reason to even read it. But he couldn't quite bring himself to throw the letter away. Instead, he took it home, found a great big trunk that his wife stored blankets and coats in during the summer when they didn't need them. And he plowed his uh, paw down through all that pile of blankets and coats and everything and stuck that letter right in the very bottom of the trunk, put the lid down and thought, well, that takes care of that. And year after year, he just kept being more angry, grumpier, more difficult to live with, forgot all about the letter, but his wife, kept reading the review week by week and the people still wondered about those poor children and poor Matilda living with that grumpy man. Well many years later, about 26 or 7 years later, for whatever reason, obviously the Holy Spirit, but for one day Elder uh, Brother Smith saw that review there and the lead article on the front page was by Ellen White and he picked it up. And he read the article. Then he thought to himself, well, that isn't so bad. Well, he put it back down. Of course, he didn't want his wife to know that he'd read her paper. And the next week, another issue of the review came. Back in those days, this would be the 1880s by now, back in those days, most weeks, the lead article was one by Ellen White. And he read it again, and he thought, that isn't so bad. But he put it back. He didn't want his wife to know that he was reading it. Well, this went on for several months. And the effect of the messages was beginning to have an impact on Stephen Smith's life. He didn't lose his temper quite so fast. He wasn't quite so angry every day. And people were wondering, what, what is causing this change in Brother Smith? But nobody could quite figure it out. Well, in 1885, Eugene Farnsworth, the son of William Farnsworth, one of the first Sabbath keepers in the Washington, New Hampshire church. Eugene now was grown up, he was a minister, but he was coming home to see his father and his stepmother, his mother having died. And so he was coming to Washington, New Hampshire to see his father and his stepmother. And it was announced that Eugene was going to preach. He would be there visiting for two weeks. There were three Sabbaths, but two weeks in between. And the word got out, even over to Unity, New Hampshire, where the Smiths were living, some way that they heard that Eugene was coming. And Mrs. Smith was very startled one day when her husband announced, I think we'll go to church next Sabbath. Now he hadn't been to church for years. And even though he was a little more mellow, this was a surprise, but his wife knew you don't argue with Stephen. If he's going to church next Sabbath, we're going to church next Sabbath. He said, I want to hear Eugene. I want to see how he turned out, what kind of a minister he is. And so off they went to church the next Sabbath morning. Well, Eugene Farnsworth had no idea that Stephen Smith was going to be there. And if he had known, he probably would not have picked the topic that he chose to speak on that Sabbath. But he talked about the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a movement of prophecy. Well, 
Stephen Smith had been fighting the church. He'd been fighting anything to do with Ellen White. He'd been fighting to do with anything that was Seventh-day Adventist related. And so when Eugene saw him in the congregation, he knew that either he wouldn't get clear through the sermon before Stephen would stand up, or at the end of it, certainly he was going to get a blast from Stephen Smith. Sure enough, the sermon was over, and here's this old man standing to his feet. And Eugene, who wrote about this just a few days later, that's how can we know this story, thought, oh no, here it comes. But Stephen Smith didn't say anything negative. In fact, he said, my oh, brothers and sisters, I didn't come here to criticize. Um, I came here to, to see Eugene, but I want to say something about this church. Of course, Eugene had just been talking about the church. He said, I want to say something. He said, um, you know, I've noticed that through the years there have been these various attacks on the church. But all of these different groups have disappeared. None of them exist anymore. All that's left is the church. And I've come to realize that God is with this church and I want to fellowship with it again. Well, you can almost, when you read the story, you can almost just feel the congregation going, Phew. I mean, this was exactly the opposite of what they were expecting Stephen Smith to say. Well, church is over, everybody goes home. And during the following week, Stephen Smith begins to think about this letter that he'd received about 27 or 28 years earlier from Ellen White. And on Thursday of that week, he remembers the letter and what did I do with it? I can picture him, where did I put that thing? Oh yeah, in that trunk. And I can in my imagination see him go down, pawing down through the blankets and coats and things his wife had stored in there, pawing around, oh, there it is. And now he pulls out this letter, yellow with age. And for the first time in his life, he wants to know what's in there. Well, the next Sabbath, he's back in church. And again, Eugene knew he that Stephen Smith had been in church the previous week, but he didn't know what had happened on Thursday. And here was the topic. He, uh, Elder Farnsworth talked about the gift of prophecy in the remnant church. Now again, that's something that in the past would have set Stephen off, but Stephen sat quietly through the whole sermon, and then he was on his feet again. And here's in essence what he said afterwards. He said, I received a letter from Ellen White 28 years ago, but I didn't read it till Thursday. And then he went on to tell how in this letter, Ellen White had urged Stephen Smith to settle into the truth, to know what you believe. Don't chase after every idea that goes blowing through the church. And he went on to say, Stephen Smith went on to say, I think about all the money and all the time I've wasted donating to this, donating to that, going on and on about how people have attacked Ellen White. He said, but I've come to the place where I believe that every word she wrote is from God. And I accept the letter that she wrote to me so many years ago as being a message from God for me. He said, I'm too old now to go out to our people and to tell what God has done for me. But he said, I want you to go and share my story. And when you do, make certain that you add the following. And so I'll close this story with what Stephen Smith asked. Make certain that you tell whoever hears my story tell them that another rebel has surrendered. How sad that for 27, 28 years in the bottom of that trunk was exactly what Stephen Smith needed. In fact, maybe some of us have on our bookshelves the exact information counsel that we need, both in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. Would that we not be like Stephen Smith and waste most of our lives being unhappy, unlovable Christians when the counsel is there on how to live a happy, successful life. I praise the Lord that Stephen Smith in his old age came to realize the value of the counsel of the spirit of prophecy. I'm just sorry that it took him so long to find it. Ellen White had no use for what she called sour 
piety. She didn't think that a long face properly represented the Adventist religion. She thought we should be the happiest people on earth. One time her granddaughter, her oldest granddaughter, Ella, was upset about something. And her grandmother said to her, Ella May, if you could think of a person that had no money, no friends, and was dying of an incurable disease, yet the plan of salvation and the hope of a glorious future should keep that person singing from morning to night. Now we all sometimes get discouraged and we do have down days. And Ellen White tells us that when those kind of things happen, what's a very practical way to lift your spirits? Sing a hymn. She encourages us to sing a hymn if we have one of those down days because as I said, her view is she had no use for sour piety. We should be happy, Seventh-day Adventists. On November 3, 1890, Ellen White was given a very significant vision. The place was Salamanca, New York. She had been there for a few days holding meetings. And uh, either before she got there or while she was there, she came down with a very bad cold or maybe it was the flu. Anyway, she was very ill. And when she got home that Monday night, November 3, got back to her room where she was staying, she thought she could not go on. She was scheduled to make a number of other appointments, meet a number of other appointments. She just felt she couldn't, she was too sick. But she prayed and God strengthened her. And during that night, he gave her this significant vision. The next morning, when the people came from, that were traveling with her came to a room, they all assumed we're cutting short the trip and we're headed back to Battle Creek because Mrs. White had been so ill. But she said, no, I've been healed. And besides, she said, I want to tell you about this prophetic dream, this vision that I had last night. But she couldn't remember it. But to show you that she really was healed, not only did they leave Salamanca and go on down into the state of Virginia, this was Salamanca, New York, go on down into the state of Virginia where her next appointments were. While she was down there, she played tourist a little bit. I mean, she was human, so once in a while she liked to play tourist. And she went through the Luray Caverns. And then after the meetings in Virginia, she traveled back up to Brooklyn, New York, and uh, had other appointments in the state of Connecticut and the state of Massachusetts, came back down to Washington, D.C., and didn't actually get home to Battle Creek, Michigan, until December 30th. So it was almost two months after she had been so ill and thought she was going to have to cut short her trip. But she's there in Battle Creek, and the general conference session was held in March, early March of 1891, in the Tabernacle uh, in Battle Creek. And she spoke several times during the general conference session. On the Sabbath afternoon, March 7, she was uh, featured as the speaker. And two or three times during her sermon, which was about we shouldn't hide our identity, uh, she was urging us to let people know who we are and not to try to keep it from them that we're Seventh-day Adventists. Two or three times during that talk, she said several, uh, several weeks ago, or when I was in Salamanca, some way she was trying to refer back to this vision, this prophetic dream that God had given her, but she could never remember it. And uh, one person that was there wrote later that after three or four times of trying to recall it, she seemed frustrated with herself and said, well, I'll have more to say about that later. And it was like, I'm, I'm really disgusted with myself that I can't remember that vision. Well, she, concluded her talk and then she had a few words, a short presentation to the ministers. And after the second presentation that afternoon, the one to the ministers, why the president of the general conference, O.A. Olson, uh, said to, to Ellen White, are you planning on coming to the early morning workers meeting? Now, early morning devotionals, early morning workers meetings really were early in those days. It was at 5.30 a.m. None of this like seven o'clock or something. This was a 5.30 a.m. devotional. She said, no, she said, I think I've spoken several times. Uh, I think I'll sleep in tomorrow. So everybody knew Ellen White was not coming to that early morning workers meeting. Well, the next morning, her son, W.C. White, who had a house not about half a block or block from where his mother was staying, 
He was walking to the tabernacle and walked by the place where Mrs. White was staying. And he had a couple of ministers with him and he noticed the light was on in his mother's room. And he thought, well, maybe mother's ill. I better go find out, check on her. So he went up, knocked on her door. There she was all dressed, ready to go. She said the angel had awakened her about three that morning and that she should go to the meeting. So when they got to the tabernacle, just another block or two from where she was staying, they got to the tabernacle while the ministers were just getting up from prayer. And Elder Olson, the president, looked over and saw Mrs. White and her son and these two other ministers come in. And he's very startled because the last word he'd had from her the night before was, I'm not coming. So he looks at her and he says, do you have something for us? Yes, she said, I do, indeed I do. And she began to uh, talk about a meeting that she had seen in vision. And in this meeting, she described how there was a discussion about taking the, uh, the um, Seventh-day Sabbath truth out of our religious liberty paper, the American Sentinel. And she talked about how she had been shown that we should not do this. We must not hide our light. We must let people know who we are. And we need to leave the Seventh-day Sabbath in the American Sentinel. And so she talked about this vision that she'd had. And when she'd finished, one of the men, one, a man stood up, one of the men in the congregation there and said, I was in that meeting last night when this was discussed. And then, and he said, I couldn't have described better what happened in the meeting than what you just heard. And another man stood up and said, I was in that meeting last night also. Now it was Ellen White's turn to be surprised. Someone who was there recorded later that she looked just totally nonplussed by this. She couldn't believe it. She said, last night, last night, I thought this meeting was held back when I had the vision in Salamanca, which was about three months earlier. Well, you can imagine that with this kind of evidence that we should leave the Sabbath in our religious liberty paper, guess what? They had another meeting of that little committee. <laughs> the Sabbath that had been voted out a few hours earlier was now voted back into the American Sentinel, and it remained in our religious liberty paper as a witness to the holiness of God's fourth commandment, the Seventh-day Sabbath. The last day of the Ministerial Institute in Battle Creek, Michigan was January 3, 1875. Ellen White was ill. In fact, they thought she should be in the sanitarium because they were afraid that her bad cold would turn into pneumonia. But James White didn't want her to go to the sanitarium. He wanted the people at the Ministerial Institute to be able to hear her. And so he called several of the ministers, leading ministers, to their home to pray for Ellen White. And they did pray, and she was given a vision, and she was healed. They later went to the meeting. They went to the dedication of the Battle Creek College the next day. When she came out of that vision on the evening of the 3rd, though, he asked her if she wanted to tell what she'd been shown. She said, no, not right now. But sometime either the next day or a few days later, we're not quite sure when, she began to share a little bit about the fact that she had been shown publishing houses around the world and the mission work growing. And her husband said, do you remember any of the countries? And she said, no, no, I don't. Oh yes, she said. I do remember the angel said, Australia. So 10 years later, Elder Haskell, S.N. Haskell decided to go help fulfill that part of the uh, vision. And he went as our first missionary, one of our first missionaries to Australia. Now, the interesting thing about that vision, even more so than the angel said Australia, was that 10 years later, Ellen White was called to Europe as a missionary. And she lived in Europe from 1885 to 1887. And most of that time, she was, her headquarters was in Switzerland, though she traveled around to several other countries while she was there. But when she first got to Basel, to where our headquarters of our work was in Europe at that time, Basel, Switzerland, why they wanted to give her a tour of the building. And so they took her to the printing facility and she came into the room and she looked around and she said, I think I've been here before. Well, of course she had never been there before. She'd just arrived. And there were a couple of young men working there running the presses. And she said, uh, where's the older man? 
And they kind of looked surprised. As I say, this was her first visit. And they said, oh, the older man, the foreman, he's gone into town on business. Well, she had a message for him. And it was a message that had been given to her 10 years before on January 3, 1875. Well, sometime later, while she was in Europe, she was in Christiana, today Oslo, Norway. And we had a publishing house then in what's now Oslo. And again, she felt like she had been there before and she had some counsel. And it was counsel that she had first seen in the vision of 1875. Then a few years after that, she was in Australia. She arrived in Australia in 1891. And after a, sh a short span of time getting there and all, why they took her to the publishing house in Melbourne. And once again, she said she'd seen these presses. And once again, it was from that same vision in 1875. And she had some counsel for them that had been given to her now 16 or so years before. So when God speaks to a prophet, sometimes it's counsels on things that have happened in the past so we can learn lessons. Sometimes it's for things that are going on right now so we can have counsel on how to do things better. And once in a while, it's like this vision, the counsel is given way in advance. And we then, when we hear about the stories, we can know that God is actually speaking through this prophet because of the miraculous way the messages have come. Sometimes we forget that Ellen White was actually married to somebody. His name was James White. He didn't live as long as his wife. He died in 1881 and she didn't die until 1915. So we talk more about her, we know about her. She was the messenger of the Lord. But think about what kind of a man James must have been. I don't know if men ever have thought it would be like to be married to a prophet. I mean, just think about it. Your wife says to you, honey, I think you need to do this. Or, honey, I think you need to do that. What if your wife said to you, honey, the Lord has shown me that you should do this. Or the Lord has shown me that you should do that. Well, sometimes that happened to James. And James was a strong personality. He would not naturally just do what somebody tells him to do. And yet, the evidence is that over and over, when God spoke through Ellen White with a special message for her husband, he accepted. Now, he didn't always know exactly how to make things happen. Think about the first paper, our first little paper, The Present Truth. She had the vision in late 1848, and she was shown that this paper should, would be small at first, and it should be like streams of light that would go clear around the world. That's November 18, 1848. And when she came out of the vision, she told him that he should start a little paper. He had no idea how to start a paper. Now that's different than refusing, he just didn't know how to do it. And it wasn't until July of 1849, so several months later, that James White actually brought out the first issue of The Present Truth. Throughout his life, he was always doing things. He was a, he was a very active man. He, um, I think it's sometimes he may have embarrassed his wife a little bit um, because he was so energetic and so creative and all. Uh, one time they, she was not feeling well, she was sick and they were traveling and they came into Kalamazoo, Michigan and they were going, they had speaking appointments there. They were going to get off the train in Kalamazoo. As I say, she didn't feel good anyway, but it was the state fair was going on and the platform was just packed full of people. And so James is looking out the window. He knows his wife doesn't feel good and he's thinking, how in the world am I going to get us off here? because everybody's going to be, as soon as the train stops, everybody's going to be pushing onto the train and we've got to try to get off and she's not feeling good anyway. So he came up with one of his creative ideas. He just picked her up and he said, make way, sick woman, make way, sick woman. And everybody started parting and they got off and somebody pushed off their luggage and they made their appointment. Uh, to give you another idea about James and the kind of creative, he didn't let things bother him a lot. At one time he was preaching. And as he was preaching, he got so animated in his sermon that he fell right off the platform, right in the middle of while he was preaching. Now, most people, if you fall off the platform, 
that would cause you to stop right there. But according to the reports, no, not James, he just worked it in as a sermon illustration, climbed right back up on the platform, kept preaching the whole time. People thought he'd planned it. They thought he was part of his sermon. No, he admitted it wasn't, but since it happened, you know, just go with it. So uh, James was that kind of person. James was a great builder. A number of our institutions, a number of our major papers were started by James White. He was an organizer. He had the ability to make money. He had the ability to raise money. And um, when you look at lists of donations, it might embarrass us today if we did what they did back in those days, but in those days, if there was some appeal for means, then they would print right in the church paper, in the review, how much they would list you by name and how much you've given and what city you lived in. So everybody knew whether you gave or not. But James and Ellen were always right at the top of the list. They, were, they gave to everything. And James had to make money. I mean, how else could he make all those kind of donations? Some from the royalties from his wife's uh, books and some, of course, from uh, things that he sold and things that he did. But he was a very creative individual. And I know um, sometimes I've asked young girls when they look at these pictures of James and Ellen White. And he, of course, is bald headed and he's got a big beard and he looks old. And I'll say to the girls, what do you think Ellen saw in him? Why do you think she ever wanted to marry him? And of course, they usually laugh. But what she saw in him was a creative man who was thoroughly committed to God and one that loved her. Now, of course, they did have some stresses in a marriage, like any marriage, but loved her. He once wrote that she was the crown of his rejoicing. And in turn, she said about him, she thought he was the best man that ever trod shoe leather. So they had a working, working relationship focused on advancing the kingdom of God, one that was built on mutual respect, and um, one that when you get to know James a little bit, you can understand what she saw in him. Sabbaths were always the high point in the week for the White family. Uh, when I was talking with a couple of Ellen White's grandchildren a number of years ago, they said as soon as the Sabbath would end, you know, one Sabbath would close, the family would start thinking about what they were going to do the next Sabbath. Everything was geared towards the Sabbath. Uh, these were children from Willie White's uh, second family. His first wife had died in 1890 and he remarried and so these were children from the second family so we're talking 1910, 1905, 1910 in through there. Uh, so they were living at Elm Haven in Northern California or nearby uh, Elm Haven and uh, that's a, a moderate climate so they had flowers most of the year so they told me even as the week was going on they would look around to see which flowers would be in perfect bloom by Friday so they could pick them and have bouquets at Elm Haven. Now, Friday night was different than during the week at, um, at Ellen White's home. During the week, Ellen White had a number of secretaries who had their own families. She also had her son that I just mentioned with his family, and they would have family worship in their own homes. But Friday night, everyone was invited to Ellen White's house. So Willie White and his family, as one of them said, it was about a five minute walk down the hill to grandma's house and about a seven minute walk back up the hill afterwards. But they would all be there. Everything was ready for the Sabbath. Um, the shoes had all been polished. The baths had all been taken. The food had all been prepared. Everything was ready. Sabbath was now here and they were going to grandma's house to start the Sabbath, to open the Sabbath. They would sit in the parlor. If you're ever privileged to be in California, you can go to Elm Saban. It's open. You can see where this story happened. The same chair that Ellen White sat in for worship was there, but they would come in and gather, and Ellen White would come downstairs from her writing room or her bedroom was upstairs, and she would seat herself in the chair there in the parlor, and everyone would sing. Now you might think that because it was Ellen White's house and she was the prophet, that she chose everything. No, hymn books were passed around, someone played the pump organ or the parlor organ, and uh, you'd call out a number. What's your favorite? You'd say, let's sing number so-and-so. Once in a while, Ellen White would call out a number, something she would like to sing, and they would sing. And then after they had sung, because Ellen White liked music uh, during worship, uh, after they had uh, 
sung, why uh, then she'd read. Now I'm going to tell you this not because this is what we should do. We all should have worship, but I don't want you to think this is the only way to have worship. I'm going to tell you what I was told happened in Ellen White's house. Ellen White would read from the Bible. The one granddaughter, especially Grace, that I talked to said, I don't remember grandmother ever reading anything except from the Bible for worship. I said, did your grandmother ever comment on what she had just read? No, she said, oh, I can't remember grandmother ever saying anything about it. She just let the Word of God speak for itself. Now, worships were short. Ellen White did not want to tire out her grandchildren, so she did not plan long worships. Um, so this short scripture, and then afterwards everyone would pray. Now it made no difference who was there. It could be the president of the general conference was visiting, or the local conference president, or maybe it was just the family. Everyone prayed around the circle. Short prayers, not more than a sentence or two. Now why did Ellen White want everyone to pray, including her youngest grandchild, great-grandchild, it made no difference. As soon as they could string two or three words together, they prayed. Well, if you know anything about Ellen White's story, you'll recall that when she was young, she wanted to pray out loud in the prayer meeting. This was before she became a Millerite Adventist. This was when she was a Methodist, and she was too shy. And she did not want her grandchildren growing up being too shy to pray in front of other people. So as Grace told me, she said, I've always prayed in front of other people. She said, I have friends that are petrified if they ask, will you offer a prayer or will you do this and pray in front of other people? She said, I've never done anything different. It's very natural for me to pray in front of other people. Ellen White was a very intentional individual and she had an intention even with these short prayers. Again, not long prayers. The idea was not to tire people out. The idea was everyone would say a brief prayer and everyone got comfortable praying in front of other people. Then after they had had the prayer, then one of the adults would take the children into an adjoining room and would review their Sabbath school lesson. They'd been studying it all week and the adults would review their Sabbath school lesson. Now, Saturday night or Sabbath evening, the worship was very much like Friday evening, except that after they had sung and Ellen White had read a short piece of, you know, a short selection from scripture and they'd all prayed, then because it's now sundown Saturday night, why they did a couple of things. One, if it was in the winter months, they would pop popcorn and have apples, just like a lot of families like to do, um, popcorn and apples. And then they would tell stories. What kind of, who's told stories and what kind of stories were they? Well, Grace again told me, she said, and Arthur's son, but Grace especially told me, uh, grandmother usually asked their father, Willie White, the third son of James Nell White, usually asked him to tell stories. What kind of stories did Ellen White want, it, want uh, Willie telling? Stories about, primarily stories about the history of the Adventist church. Now the Adventist movement came out of the Millerite movement of the eight, early 1840s. Willie wasn't alive then. He was born in 1854. But he'd heard stories from his parents about the early days before he was born. And then he had lived Adventist history from 1854 on, or by the time he was 10 or so he could remember it. So he's telling stories. And again, Grace said, well, why was grandmother wanting her son to tell us stories about Adventist history? Well, again, that's that intentional Ellen White. She wanted us growing up knowing the story of God's leading in the beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, Sabbaths were also special if Ellen White was going to be speaking in a nearby church. And the family loved it. Why? Well, not necessarily because Grandma was speaking. I mean, they had heard her speak. So for church members, that was special if Ellen White came to speak. But for the members, it was, I mean, the family members, it was not quite that big a thing. But the grandchildren knew that after church, there was always a picnic. On the way back home, there was always a picnic. Now, Ellen White's uh, daughter-in-law, Willie White's second wife, told me when I was visiting with her one time, that when Ellen White spoke, in those days, there was no public address system. So Ellen White had to speak from the diaphragm and project her voice 
to make herself heard. Now that takes a lot of energy. So she would be projecting her voice and by the time she was through preaching, she was wringing wet with, uh, from perspiration or from sweat. And so rather than going to the back door and shaking hands with everybody like happens in a lot of churches, why they would take Ellen White into another room, she would dry off, completely change clothes, and by this time, most everybody had left, which was fine with the grandchildren, because what were they thinking about? Picnic lunch, because they'd been in Sabbath school church all morning. And uh, depending on which church nearby, whether it was uh, St. Helena or a Calistoga, wherever it was, why they knew if they went there, we're going to have a picnic lunch at this spot. The family kind of had these favorite spots. So they would go and have their picnic lunch. When they were setting up, when they'd get to the spot and they were setting up, one of the men would take the children for a little hike while the ladies were getting the lunch out. They would take the men to get their wiggles out because they'd been sitting for Sabbath school and church. And uh, then they would have a lunch. And they were always warm lunches. They'd warm up their food. They didn't cook it on Sabbath, but they did warm their food on Sabbath. And they had what they called a fireless cooker that they could put it in. It apparently was insulated and kept the food warm. So they had a nice warm lunch. And uh, then after they'd had lunch, they were not in any rush. This was a down day. Sabbath was a day to be together, to worship God, to be out in nature. It was not like the work days. So they were not in any rush. So what would they do? Well, Ellen White had a couple of things that, that especially Grace, the granddaughter, remembered. She said, um, grandmother would usually ask that they read some mission letters. And during the week, she might have received a letter from Elder Daniels, the president of the General Conference, if he was traveling overseas, or some other minister, or maybe a missionary like Elder Stahl to South America, or Dr. Miller to China. I mean, different people would write. And so they would read these letters. Now, Ellen White had already read the letters during the week. So why would she have these letters read by someone on her staff on Sabbath afternoon? Well, again, as Grace especially told me, she said, Grandmother was very intentional. She wanted us growing up knowing that we were part of a world church, not just the little church or even the few little churches where grandmother went to speak or our little church. We were part of a world movement. And what's the natural way to do that? Here are these missionary letters from what's happening here or what's happening there. And so then another thing that she said, uh, Grace said that we often did on Sabbath afternoon was uh, they would bring out whatever chapters for whatever books were being worked on. Now the secretaries would have worked over the manuscripts and uh, prepared them so they were ready to go to the printer. Ellen White would have reread them by this time to make certain that in the secretarial process and editing and making it smooth why uh, nothing had been changed so it still said what Ellen White wanted to say. So why are they bringing out the chapters? Why are they reading them? Well Grace said especially Ellen White like Ellen White especially liked to hear uh, her daughter-in-law, Grace's mother, uh, May, read because May, if I remember correctly, she was born in England, but she had grown up in India and then later in Australia. So she had a British accent and Ellen White's accent was from the northeastern United States, from the state of Maine. And she enjoyed the, the beauty of the, uh, the British accent. So she usually asked May to read. But Grace said, why, when grandmother had already read it, she knew it was said what she wanted to say. Well, she said two things. One is she said, I can remember my grandmother sitting there kind of listening very intently. Why was she listening? She'd already read it. Well, because now she's hearing it read out loud. And sometimes sounds between words will clash. And Ellen White wanted to make certain that even the sounds, when you read it, that's one thing, but when you hear it read, the sounds flow and there's no clashing of letters, the sounds. So that was one reason. But she said the other reason that was even probably more important to Ellen White was because Ellen White knew that her grandchildren were all going to have to eventually decide, is God speaking through me or is he not? And what is the best way for a person to decide whether or not God is speaking through Ellen White? Read her writings. Her writings are self-authenticating. If you can get a person to read, they can be convinced without you having to go through all kinds of arguments. So Ellen White naturally wanted her grandchildren growing up, listening to the, the messages that God had given through her. And this was a natural way for them to decide, is God speaking through our grandmother or is he not?
Uh, it's, it's an amazing, when you stop to analyze how Ellen White uh, educated her grandchildren and how she encouraged them to give their hearts to the Lord and to be Seventh-day Adventists, to accept her ministry. I mean, it was all very intentional, but it was done so innocently. Tell us some stories or, well, let's all pray. Um, and then after the stories, or maybe before the stories, I don't know, if, I don't remember for sure which order she put them, then the family played games, simple family games. The family did everything together. They were very much family oriented. They worked together, they played together. And uh, so then that evening is over. They go back to their homes and guess what? They're already starting to focus on what's gonna happen next Sabbath because the Sabbath was the high point in the week in Ellen White's home. On Sabbath, February 13, 1915, Ellen White was going into her writing room, which was on the second floor of her home in Elmshaven in Northern, in Northern California. And whether she turned or tripped, we don't know, but she fell. And she cried out in pain. Her niece was in an adjoining room, came running and found her Aunt Ellen there in pain in the doorway going into her writing room. Her niece, of course, was afraid that her Aunt Ellen, who was 87 by this time, had fallen and broken her hip. And uh, so she tried to help her get a little more comfortable. The niece called for some other people to come. They took Ellen White to the nearby St. Helena Sanitarium, x-rayed the hip, and in fact, it was broken. In those days, they didn't pin hips. And if you were elderly and you fell and broke a hip, it was almost like a, a death sentence. Uh, pneumonia would eventually set in because you couldn't exercise. And so everyone knew that Ellen White's days, unless God worked a miracle, Ellen White's days were not going to be too much, too many more. You can imagine when the word got around among Seventh-day Adventists that Ellen White had fallen and broken her hip, there was a great deal of concern. There had never been a time before when there was not a living connection between heaven and earth in this church. What would the future be like? what would happen. Willie White, her son, Ellen White's son, knew that Adventists were very concerned and were praying around the world for his mother. And so almost every week from then until her death in July, he would send a little short notice to the review and they would print those on the back page of the review. And you can read through them and you can see as you read over the next few weeks and months that she's getting weaker and weaker. And in fact, God was gonna let her rest. When you come to just a few days before uh, she died, she was talking, this was uh, two or three days, the last, the day she actually died, she was unconscious by then. But two or three days before, her son, someone else was there in the room and she said the last words that she spoke, which were, I know in whom I have believed. There was no doubt in her mind. She had lived her life in close relationship with Jesus. She knew her salvation in him was secure and there was no fear about dying. When she actually died on Friday afternoon, uh, July 16, 1915, everyone knew the end was near. Her breathing was not as regular as it had been. Word was sent out to various members of the family and workers that, that worked there on the place for Ellen White that if you want to see her before she dies, why? you know, you better come now. And so they gathered in her writing room upstairs, which is where she had been since her accident. They'd put a hospital bed in there and that's where she was. And they gathered around her. As I said, she was unconscious by then. Talking to someone that was there that day, they said that uh, when, it, when the end came, she would inhale and then exhale and then inhale, but it was getting less and less frequent. Ellen White's second oldest granddaughter, who was a very warm and loving person, sat there next to her grandmother's bed, holding her grandmother's hand. Somewhere, Mabel, that was the granddaughter's name, Mabel had heard that occasionally, a person just before they die, though they have been unconscious, 
may come to life, or come to consciousness again. And um, if her grandmother became conscious, she wanted to make certain her grandmother knew someone was holding her hand. But the person that was there that told me said that when the end finally came, there was no struggle. It was just like a candle burning itself out. And finally the last poof, you know, the last little bit of smoke from the candle. For 70 years, Ellen White had been the Lord's messenger. For 70 years, she had brought messages of hope and instruction and encouragement to this church. And for 70 years, she had walked in a relationship with Jesus so that, as I just said, her last words a few days earlier could be with confidence, I know in whom I have believed.